Good afternoon. Good afternoon, good evening. Good afternoon, good evening. I'm, uh, I'm Paul Carice, I'm the director of this new academic department at Arizona State University, the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership, and I'm very happy to wish everyone a good Constitution Day 2018, and I'm delighted at this turnout. We're very glad that you can be here for our second annual Constitution Day lecture. We are grateful to have another distinguished lecturer this year. Last year, we had Arizona State Supreme Court Justice Clint Bullock with us. We're also grateful that leading members of the community could be with us this evening. Uh, at least one member of the state legislature, uh, State Supreme Court Justice, uh, two regents of the Arizona Board of Regents, and other public servants. Uh, I also saw that the dean of the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law, Doug Sylvester, is with us this evening. Uh, and I should add that the O'Connor College of Law and also the Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication have been our partners in our major speaker series last year on free speech and intellectual diversity, this year in 2018, 2019, on polarization and civil disagreement. And we launched that series last week. Um, the, uh, the Arizona, we're, we have a partnership with Arizona PBS, and last year for our free speech and intellectual diversity series, Arizona PBS recorded all of our events. They aired on Channel 8, and then are archived on the PBS website, and that we have the same arrangement this year. And all of the school's uh, events, special lectures like this Constitution Day lecture, all of the events in our major speaker series last year in this, all of it is archived on our website, um, and all the literature that you saw outside and also on our banners here, you can see uh, asu.skettle.edu as our website. Uh, last year, we had over 4,000 members of the ASU community and the wider Phoenix community join us for lecture events like this and for our major speaker series. So we hope you will get some literature on the school, get the calendar of speaker events that we have scheduled thus far, and that you will uh, spread the word. Just a few words about the mission of the school, and then I'm delighted to introduce our speaker. The School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership is dedicated to reviving the connection between civic education and liberal education in order to prepare thoughtful leaders for civil society and for public service. And we also have a mission to undertake civic education with the broader community and with the K-12 public schools. So on the way in, we hope you noticed the, uh, some of the extraordinary items we have in our Civic Education Classics collection that the school uh, acquired in collaboration with the Hayden Library here at ASU, spanning the founding era and the late 19th, 18th century all the way to the late 20th century. Uh, among the last items we acquired chronologically, two autographed copies of books by Martin Luther King, Jr. Uh, for our students, we believe that study of great works and great debates of civic, economic, political, and moral thought supplemented by internships and public events like this to provide experiences about leadership and statesmanship altogether provide an excellent foundation for understanding and practicing leadership in 21st century America and our globalized world. For our students and also for the broader community, we also think that a return to some fundamental ideas and debates about America and about liberal democracy more generally could provide a broader perspective and a calming perspective in our polarized and turbulent times. Our motto, as you can see, is inspiring leadership and statesmanship for the common good. All of those big ideas need to be understood by Americans at any rate within the framework of our Constitution. Uh, and that reminds me, there's another thing for you to pick up. You, you can't take the original, the first edition of the Federalist with you, 17th edition, um, but you can take a pocket constitution with you with the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, also, also the Gettysburg Address. A student who chooses to major or to minor in our school in civic and economic thought and leadership has the rare opportunity in higher education today to study fundamental ideas and debates standing behind our basic frame of government and also the chance to study the Constitution itself to include the debates we constantly have about it. Constitution Day was established by Congress in 1956, partly for these reasons, uh, 
as September 17th to honor the date in 1787 when the delegates to the Philadelphia Convention with George Washington presiding signed the final draft of the Constitution. Then in 2004, Senator Robert Byrd of West Virginia authored legislation that requires public schools and governmental organizations to provide educational programs on this day to promote a better understanding of the Constitution. It's our hope in the school that this tradition of having an annual Constitution Day lecture will promote understanding and appreciation of our nation's fundamental law and of civil debate about it. And this year, we have a distinguished historian and journalist to speak with us about one of our greatest presidents and to remind us that a substantial portion of Lincoln's greatness was that he arguably was the greatest son of the American founders ever to hold the presidential office, having spent his entire public life arguing about and advocating study of the Declaration of Independence, the Northwest Ordinance, and the Constitution as amended. I'm personally pleased to introduce Richard Brookheiser today since I've learned a great deal in two decades about America, the founding, and statesmanship from his extraordinary series of biographies of several leading American founding fathers. The first of these in 1966 was Founding Father, Rediscovering George Washington. Richard's series of relatively slim volumes, character studies of the lies of American statesmen and the ideas that guided their actions, have helped readers to rediscover the blend of gritty reality and high principle that define the extraordinary achievements of the American founding, lessons he thinks that can still shape today our thinking and feeling and acting as American citizens and leaders. His books thus far have addressed Madison and John Quincy Adams, uh, John and John Quincy Adams, and Hamilton, among others. Uh, indeed, Ron Chernow, author of the very thick biography of Hamilton that Lynn manuel Miranda drew upon for his celebrated musical, cites Richard's volume on Hamilton, this, Alexander Hamilton, American, as one of the most important books informing his own study. Richard came to the study of earlier leaders in our history in part through his work as a journalist and editor at National Review, where he began working in 1977 for its legendary founding editor, William F. Buckley. And Rick has been there ever since and been a senior editor there for several decades. He's also been a columnist in many periodicals. He currently is a columnist with American History magazine. He graduated from Yale University with a degree in English has been awarded an honorary doctorate by Washington College in 2005, a National Humanities Medal by President George W. Bush in 2008, and a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2011. He's authored a dozen books so far that does include, it does not include his forthcoming one due out in November on the great Chief Justice of the United States entitled John Marshall, The Man Who Made the Supreme Court. His remarks today will draw on, oh, I had the wrong book. His remarks today draw on this book, uh, from 2014, Founder's Son, A Life of Abraham Lincoln. Please join me in welcoming Richard Brookheiser on Lincoln's Fathers. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. There were giants in the old days. They didn't, didn't use microphones. They just projected. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Carice, and thank you to the school for having me. Uh, Constitution Day uh, asks us to consider the founding fathers, and this is something that Abraham Lincoln did throughout his mature political career, the most famously in the Gettysburg Address, where he said, our fathers brought forth on this continent the new nation conceived in liberty. That was in November 1863 two and a half years into the Civil War. But three years before that, in February 1860, in the Cooper Union Address, this was an hour and a half speech he gave in New York City. It was the kickoff of his presidential campaign. It was his East Coast debut as a political figure. And half of that speech, 90 minutes of it, was devoted to the men who had written and signed the Constitution and what they thought about the federal government's power to control slavery in the territories. And there Lincoln said, as our fathers marked it, 
let it so be marked as an evil not to be extended. Let us speak as they spoke and act as they acted upon it. Six years before that speech, October 1854, Peoria, the longest speech Lincoln ever gave in his life, three hours long. It laid out the themes of his later career, of his later life. And in that speech, he said, our Republican robe is soiled and trailed in the dust. Let us turn and wash it white in the spirit, if not the blood, of the revolution. Let us put slavery in the position that our founders put it. So a man who thinks about the founding fathers so much, uh, there were three of them that were particularly important to him. I'm going to talk about this afternoon. George Washington, Thomas Paine, and Thomas Jefferson. But when a man is so preoccupied with the fathers of his country, we, we're also curious about his actual father. So I'm going to also talk about Thomas Lincoln. And there's a fifth father who becomes important as the Civil War goes on, that is God the Father. So Thomas Lincoln was born in Virginia. He was taken as a boy to Kentucky. Uh, that's where he met his wife. Uh, he had his family. A daughter, Sarah, was born in 1807. Abraham was born in 1809. And there was a second son, Thomas, who died after a few days. Uh, when Abraham was nine years old, uh, excuse me, in 1816, the family moved to the new state of Indiana. And then in 1830, Thomas Lincoln moved his family to Illinois, which is where he lived for the rest of his life. And Thomas Lincoln was a subsistence farmer and a carpenter throughout his career. That's how he made his living. That's what he did. And in the last century, in the middle of the last century, there was a tendency to treat him as a ne'er-do-well, as an unsuccessful person. I think Lincoln biographers have gone beyond that. Uh, Thomas Lincoln never left bad debts. He never went broke. He was on several juries during his life, which was a mark of respectability, if not prosperity. He was also the trustee of a Baptist church that the Lincolns worshipped in when they lived in Indiana. Uh, when his first wife died, when Abraham was nine, Thomas waited for a year, and then he went back to Kentucky. He looked up a woman, Sarah Bush Johnston, whom he'd known years earlier. She was a widow at this point. And he said to her, your husband has died, my wife has died, I want to marry you, and I want to take you and your children back to Indiana, and you can help me raise mine. Uh, she said she had a few debts that she wanted to pay. He said, give me the list. I'll pay them today, which he did. And then they left for Indiana on the following day. So in many ways, Thomas Lincoln was a responsible man. He provided for himself, and he provided for his family. But he and Abraham never got along. They never saw eye to eye. One of the differences between them was work. As soon as Abraham grew out to his full adult, adult size as a young teenager, Thomas loaned him out to neighbors to plow their fields, to split rails for their fences. And all the money that Abraham made, Thomas would take and spend it on the family. Now, this was a common practice in those days. But common practices take different people different ways. And Abraham Lincoln didn't like it. And I don't think it's fanciful to see some of his resistance to slavery coming from his own experience of economic slavery. Now, of course, his would end when he turned 21, and then he would leave his family and he would be on his own. A slave's slavery never ends unless he runs away or unless he's freed or Sometimes slaves were allowed to, to work and earn enough money to free themselves. But their servitude was lifelong, as Lincoln was not, was not. Still, he resented it. A second difference between himself and his father was education. Thomas Lincoln sent Sarah and Abraham to one-room schoolhouses. And these were fly-by-night schools. They depended on the presence in the neighborhood of some young man 
with enough education to teach and enough physical strength to keep the larger boys in line. And Abraham went to two of those when he was a small boy in Kentucky and three more after the family moved to Indiana. When you add up all the time he spent in these schools, it comes to a year. Uh, he's the least educated president along with George Washington and Andrew Johnson. But he did learn how to read, how to write, and how to do simple arithmetic. And these were skills that Thomas Lincoln wanted him to have. He thought these were skills that would help him in the kind of life that Thomas Lincoln had led, the life of a farmer or the life of a carpenter or some other artisan. But for Lincoln, for Abraham Lincoln, education was very different. It was a portal. Reading was a door into other worlds. And it was a door into himself and into his own thoughts. Lincoln's stepmother, uh, Sarah Bush Johnson, later Sarah Lincoln, she got this about her stepson. She saw how he learned. She saw how he listened. When adults came to the Lincoln house and talked about something that was unfamiliar to him, he wouldn't say anything. But after they had gone, he would ask, what was that about? What did that mean? When he read something that impressed him, he would copy it. He'd write it down. If he didn't have paper, he'd write it on a board with charcoal. If he filled up the board, he'd plane it off and continue writing. He'd try to put it in his own words. He'd try to organize it into his own thoughts. So he was using education to broaden himself and to deepen himself. And this was something that Thomas Lincoln never understood. When Abraham wrote a campaign autobiography, uh, he said of his father that he only learned bunglingly to write his own name. And I thought how much anger there is in that word bunglingly. He didn't have to say that. He could have said my father only learned how to write his own name. Or my father only learned how to write his own name and that was hard enough. But he said bunglingly. And that shows the resentment and the disagreement that the two of them had. Nevertheless, there were three things, I think, that Abraham got from Thomas Lincoln, three important things. One was physical strength. They were built differently. Thomas was 5'10", stocky. Abraham, we all know, was over six feet, lanky. But they were both strong, powerful men. And this helped them in the communal hazing rituals that every man in early 19th century America had to go through, especially if you're moving into a new place. You have to match yourself with the local tough guy in a fight or a wrestling match or some physical competition. And these were tests that both Thomas and Abraham Lincoln passed. So that's one thing he got from his father. A second thing that he got from his father was the temperance. Thomas Lincoln didn't drink, and neither did Abraham. And in early 19th century America, this was very rare. We were a nation of alcoholics. Uh, people have calculated how much average Americans drank, and it's hair-raising. There was a professor at Columbia, Stephen Mitchell, who, who became a senator, and he calculated that artisans in New York drank a quart of hard liquor a week. And this, was, this would all be on the day off on Sunday. Uh, and, and these patterns uh, also existed in rural America. Uh, it probably uh, caused a lot of the fighting that occurred. But neither Thomas nor Abraham Lincoln uh, participated in this. The third and the most important thing that Abraham got from his father was storytelling. Uh, we know this from two cousins of Abraham uh, with the name of Hanks. So they were uh, n nephews of his mother, and they lived with the Lincoln family. They grew up with the Lincoln family. And one of them later said that Thomas Lincoln was as good a storyteller as Abraham. Another one said he was better. I don't know about better, but clearly Thomas Lincoln had the gift of telling stories. And this was something that Abraham Lincoln uh, would use throughout his life. Uh, there's a story from one of the uh, Hanks cousins that uh, when a stranger would ride up to the Lincoln farm, Sometimes Abraham would get in the first word, and occasionally his father would smack him. And I thought maybe the father was uh, upset that he was um, interfering with his setups for his own stories. Uh, Lincoln certainly would have 
resented the smacks, but he retained the gift of telling stories. Uh, Abraham Lincoln named one son after his father. Uh, he named a horse after his father, Old Tom. Thomas died in 1851. Ten years later, when Abraham was uh, leaving Illinois to become president, he visited his father's grave, and he saw there was no stone on it. And he said, I have to, I have to put a stone here, and he never did. So that was the end of his relationship with Thomas Lincoln. And if we don't get everything we want or need from our parents, none of us ever does. We never get all of it. We have to look to surrogates. We have to look to surrogate parents to supply the gap. And if you were a young man in early 19th century America, the handiest surrogates were the founding fathers, the men who had won the revolution and who had written the Constitution. And some of these men were still alive, still serving in office when Lincoln was a boy. Lincoln was born one month before Thomas Jefferson left the White House at the end of his second term. After Jefferson, James Madison was president for eight years. And after Madison, James Monroe, the last founder president, served for another eight years. So that's up into Abraham Lincoln's teens. But then, in the 1830s, when Abraham Lincoln is in his 20s, this generation of leaders dies off. Uh, they never came to Kentucky or Indiana or Illinois. And Lincoln never went to the East Coast where they lived until much later. So if he wanted to meet any of these men, he would have to meet them in books. And one of the most important books he read was about the most important of the Founding Fathers. That was The Life and Exploits of General George Washington by Mason Locke Weems, who we know as Parson Weems. Now, Parson Weems was a clergyman. He was an Episcopal clergyman. But he made his living as a printer and a seller of books. He would go up and down the East Coast with a stock of books. He would take orders. He would publish a lot of these books himself. George Washington dies in 1799. And Weems realizes that a biography of Washington would be a bestseller. So he brings out his life in 1800. He'd actually met Washington once, and he'd had one exchange of letters with Washington. Uh, in his book, he turns this on the title page into the, into the claim that he was the rector of Mount Vernon Parish. Now, there's no such parish, and he was not the rector of it. But uh, he thought he had enough of a connection to say that. I'm afraid publishers still do this. Uh, in 1808, he brings out a second edition. And this is the edition that Lincoln would have read, possibly as early as Kentucky, certainly after the family moves to Indiana. And Weems is one of those writers. He's like James Fenimore Cooper or H.P. Lovecraft. The sentences are terrible, but the stories are great. And the proof is that we remember, we all know one of Weems' stories, which is the story of Washington and the cherry tree. And the story goes that uh, George's father, Augustine, uh, buys a special cherry tree, no doubt from an orchard in England. And at the same time, he gives his young son a hatchet. And as George is swinging this hatchet around, he accidentally chops the bark of the cherry tree. The father sees what happens. He goes to his son, asks him, do you know how this happened? And George says, I can't tell a lie, Pa. You know I can't tell a lie. I did it. And then what we tend to forget is Augustine's reaction. He says, come to my arm, my son. Your honesty is far more valuable than any cherry tree. So this book, it's partly a young adult book. It's aimed at children, and it's trying to tell them you know, to be honest, but it's also aimed at parents. And it's telling them, if your child does something wrong and then admits it, you know, don't, don't punish them severely. Uh, praise their honesty, because that's the more important thing. But this is not the story that got Lincoln's attention. He was not interested in stories about Washington being a good boy. He was interested in Weems's stories about Washington being a great man. And we know this because Lincoln himself said it. He said it in 1861. 
when he was on his way to Washington to be inaugurated. He left Springfield, his home, in February, and he took a train through the Midwest and through the Northeast to go to Washington. And this was as the country was falling apart. South Carolina had seceded in December. Uh, five more states left uh, in January. Texas would secede the day he arrived in Washington. So in this crisis atmosphere, he's showing himself uh, to the nation. He's showing the flag as he makes this trip. And when he passes through Trenton, New Jersey, he gives a speech to the New Jersey legislature. And he says that when he was a boy, in the earliest days of being able to read, he read a little book about George Washington by Parson Weems. And the thing that most impressed him was Weems' account of the Battle of Trenton. Now, the Battle of Trenton was the battle a few days after Christmas, 1776. This followed six months of defeat for George Washington and the Continental Army. Washington was chased out of New York. He was chased out of New York State. The British chased him across New Jersey. At the end of the year, he crossed the Delaware River into Pennsylvania. Then the British pulled their main forces back. They expected in the next spring they would just march on and wrap this war up. But Washington turned. He crossed back over the Delaware and made a surprise attack on Trenton. He captured 900 Hessian soldiers and only uh, suffered two casualties in his forces. It was a, an impressive victory. It didn't end the war, but it meant that the war was not going to be lost. There might be a chance to win this, to keep on and to win this thing. And so Lincoln tells the New Jersey legislature that he read about the Battle of Trenton and Weems, and he said, boy though I was, I thought there was something important in what those men were fighting for, something important to all men and to all times. And he explained that what that was was liberty. Now if you go back and read Weems, that's exactly how Weems describes the Battle of Trenton. Because after he gets the American army over the Delaware, and he spends two pages describing the ice and the cold and the difficulty of the crossing, then they still have a couple more miles to go to Trenton. And Weems introduces an allegorical figure. It's a woman who's hovering over the American troops. And this is the spirit of liberty. And Weems says she's been driven out of Europe. She's come to the New World as her last refuge. But her enemies have followed with armies and navies. Who will defend her? Only this ragged band of men. Weems is presenting the Battle of Trenton as a struggle for the fate of liberty in the world. And the words that he put into George Washington's mouth before the battle begins were, all I ask of you men is to remember what you were fighting for. In 1861, Lincoln remembered. And he was telling the New Jersey legislature, we may have another fight, and this is what this will be about. When Lincoln was in his 20s, he encountered a second, a second founding father, and this was Thomas Paine. Now, Thomas Paine fits a little oddly among the founding fathers. He, uh, he never fought in any battles. He never held any political office, no elected political office. He was a clerk of a con congressional committee briefly. But what he was was the great journalist of the American Revolution. In January 1776, he wrote Common Sense. This was an argument for independence six months before Congress declared it. It sold 150,000 copies. This was in a country of 3 million people. So today, that would be a sale of 16 and a half million. Uh, I'll take that. <laughs> uh, then he followed it at the end of 1776 with an essay called The American Crisis. And this is the essay that begins, these are the times that try men's souls. And I'm a journalist, and I have to tell you that is the greatest lead sentence that has ever been or ever will be. Washington had that read to his troops before the Battle of Trenton when he was asking enough of them to reenlist 
so that he could fight on. Their enlistments were up. They could have gone home. But Washington read pain to them and got enough of them to carry on the struggle. But after the war, Paine kept writing. And one of the books he wrote was called The Age of Reason. And this was a ferocious attack on organized religion. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt would later call Paine a filthy little atheist. Paine always said he was never an atheist. He said he believed uh, in one God and one God only. But he thought organized religions were conspiracies to terrify and enslave mankind. So in the Age of Reason, he has a couple hits at Islam. He has some more at Judaism. But most of his fire is directed at the religion that he and his readers knew best, which was Christianity. And Paine says the moment in his own life where he turned against Christianity occurred when he was a boy. And someone in his family was giving a reading of a sermon on the substitutionary, substitutionary atonement which is the Christian doctrine that Christ died for our sins. And Paine remembered uh, claims that after the sermon was over, he walked out into the garden of his house. Mm -hmm. And he said, I revolted at the recollection of what I had heard and thought to myself that it was making God Almighty act like a passionate man that killed his son when he could not revenge himself any other way. And as I was sure a man would be hanged that did such a thing, I could not see for what purpose they preach such sermons. So Paine writes an entire book. He knows the Bible very well. And he, he looks for every contradiction that he can find. Now, these um, contradictions or seeming contradictions have been written about for hundreds of years by Christians, by enemies of Christianity. They've been uh, gone over and over again. Paine is not interested in any of that. He's reading the Bible as if for the first time, and he's making his own list of mocking contradictions. Uh, when Lincoln encountered Paine, uh, he was past his 21st year. He moved out of the family household. He would moved out from under the wings of his father, Thomas. And like many 20-somethings, he thought, this is just great. You know, what my parents believed, it doesn't make any sense. It's full of holes. I don't have to believe all this stuff. And he was so impressed with pain that he wrote a painite pamphlet of his own. And we know this because uh, he shared it with some young friends of his who one of them wrote about this later on. This was when Lincoln was a postmaster. Uh, in his early 20s, he, he bounced through a number of jobs. He worked on a riverboat. He was a blacksmith. He was a surveyor. One of the jobs he had was a postmaster. And in those days, there were no post offices. A postmaster would set up in someone's store. He'd have a table in the store. And you'd bring him your letters, or you'd go to pick up your letters. And mostly, he sat around and read everyone's newspapers and, and talked with his friends. Now, on this particular day, he's sharing his Paynite uh, pamphlet with them. And the owner of the store, a man named Samuel Hill, asked to see it. And Lincoln gave it to him, and Mr. Hill put it in the stove. And the reason he did that is that Lincoln was already interested in politics. And Samuel Hill knew you can't have a career in politics in Illinois in the 1830s when you've written a pamphlet saying that the Bible is nonsense and full of holes. So Samuel Hill did, did the young Mr. Lincoln a great favor. Now, Lincoln would change his religious ideas over time. But what I think he took from Paine per permanently was how to use humor to make serious points. He didn't have to learn about humor from Paine. He knew that already from his father. But from Paine, he used how to use humor in serious arguments. I mean, Paine was very good at taking a complex argument and seeming to cut it down to the essentials, doing it in a funny way, but also making a serious point. Uh, what he had to say about the virgin birth was that if a young girl today was got with child and said that it was by a ghost and that a bird told her, would she be believed? Now, of course, the ghost and the bird are the Holy Spirit, symbols of the Holy Spirit. And there had been centuries of writing about the virgin birth. What is the meaning of this? 
why did God do this? How could this have happened? Again, Payne is not interested in any of that. He takes it down to the essentials, and he makes a joke to make a point. Uh, similarly, Lincoln in the 1850s, uh, over and over again, he would have to answer a Democratic Party charge that the only reason Republicans are concerned with slavery is that they want to sleep with black women. You know, what other reason could they have? They want to have sex with black women. And this was a staple of Democratic Party rhetoric. And so Lincoln's response to it uh, would be to say, just because I don't want a black woman for a slave doesn't mean I want to have her for a wife. I can just let her alone. And sometimes he would say there are enough black men to marry all the black women and enough white men to marry all the white women, and so let them be married. So he's taking this, this knot uh, of sexual and racial anxieties and just cutting it down to the essentials, making a joke of it. But he's also leaving a serious point. Because if you let the black woman alone, you're letting her free. So he's getting the laugh out of his audience, but he's leaving them with a serious thought. And I believe this is a technique he learned from Thomas Paine. The third founding father, who becomes important to Lincoln in his mature political career, is Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson is a complicated man. Sometimes I think Jefferson's mind is like a house with a lot of rooms that don't all have doors. <laughs> uh, and you can look at Jefferson's career and see a lot of backsliding, a lot of timidity, a lot of falling away from early principles. But Lincoln's Jefferson is the young Jefferson. It's the 33-year-old man who wrote the Declaration of Independence and said in that that all men are created equal. And this was something that Lincoln would turn to and talk about over and over again in the 1850s and the 1860s. In 1859, he was invited to a celebration of Jefferson's birthday in Boston by Republicans there. He couldn't go, but he sent a message which he expected would be printed in the newspapers, and he, he took care over it. He wanted to make an important statement. And in that, he said that Jefferson wrote the definitions and the axioms of a free society. He said, all honor to Jefferson, who had the coolness and the forecast to put into a merely revolutionary document a statement that would be pertinent to all men in all time. So he's saying that Jefferson was doing what Washington did at the Battle of Trenton. Washington did it as a warrior. Jefferson is doing it as a writer. They are both making statements for liberty, which is not just their own liberty, but liberty that applies to all men. And of course, the most famous example of Lincoln's reverence for Jefferson is the Gettysburg Address. Because four score and seven years ago, it's 87 years. 87 from 1863 is 1776, the year of the Declaration of Independence. Lincoln is saying, our nation begins with that declaration. That declaration says what we are all about. And that is what we're commemorating here at Gettysburg. The Gettysburg Address was given to inaugurate a cemetery for the men who had died at the battle. There had been a lot of death in Lincoln's life. Uh, his mother had died when he was nine. Uh, his sister Sarah died when he was 20. He'd had a little uh, brother who had died when he was a boy. Lincoln's first sweetheart died when he was in his early 20s. Uh, Lincoln also uh, lived through several American Wars, the War of 1812 when he was very young, uh, the Black Hawk War, that was an Indian war in northern Illinois that Lincoln actually served in. He never saw a combat, but he did see a group of men who had just been scalped. And he remembered that on the tops of their heads there were holes the size of silver dollars. And he said blood seemed to be everywhere. But this was a common experience of death in early 19th century America. But the Civil War was something different. 
The Civil War was something worse. And it did touch Lincoln personally, not only as commander in chief. One of the first casualties of the war was a man named Elmer Ellsworth. Elmer Ellsworth had studied law with Lincoln in Illinois. He'd accompanied him on his train to his first inauguration. And early in the war, a rebel flag flew over a hotel in Alexandria, Virginia. It was large enough that it could be seen from the White House with a spyglass. So Ellsworth led a party of Union men to capture Alexandria and capture this hotel and tear down this flag. As he was going up the steps of the hotel, the owner shot and killed him. And he was shot and killed in turn by Ellsworth's second in command. And Lincoln wrote a letter of condolence to Ellsworth's parents. At the end of 1861, the Battle of Ball's Bluff, he lost another friend from Illinois, Edward Baker. Lincoln had named one of his sons after Edward Baker. Baker had moved to Oregon and become a senator. He was the man who introduced Lincoln to the crowd on the podium of his first inaugural. Baker joined the army. He was killed at the Battle of Ball's Bluff. Someone who saw Lincoln at the funeral said that he wept like a child. Another Illinoisan was William McCullough. Lincoln knew him because he was the clerk of Bloomington uh, County Court. And Lincoln appeared at this court during his uh, time as a lawyer. At the beginning of the war, McCullough wrote him to ask his help to get into an Illinois cavalry regiment. He needed Lincoln's help because he was 50 years old and he had only one arm. He'd lost an arm in a farming accident, but he still wanted to fight for the Union and for liberty. He got in a cavalry regiment. He became a colonel, and he was killed in December 1862 in northern Mississippi in the run-up to the Battle of Vicksburg. Sometimes Lincoln saw the effects of war personally. He and his wife would visit soldiers uh, for Union hospitals. He was accompanied on one trip by a man named Noah Brooks. This was another young acquaintance from Illinois. Brooks had moved to California. He was a reporter for the Sacramento Union, and they sent him back east to cover the Lincoln administration and the war. Because he knew the president, he had good access. So he and Lincoln are moving down a line of beds of injured men. Ahead of them is a charitable woman distributing tracts to the wounded. And they see that one soldier glances at her tract and then drops it with a laugh. When Lincoln comes up to him, he says, according to Brooks, uh, that wasn't a very nice thing to do. She's trying to be helpful. And the soldier said, well, Mr. President, she gave me a tract on the sin of dancing, and my legs have been blown off. And that has the shape of a joke. That has the shape of a joke. But of course, the joke is on Lincoln and the soldier. So if you take these incidents and multiply them by 10 and by 1,000 and by 100,000, that is what the Civil War is like. And all the casualty reports are crossing Lincoln's desk as the commander in chief. And all the casualties on the other side are also Americans, because Lincoln never admitted that the states had the right to secede. So even though they were in rebellion, they were still Americans. So everybody who is being injured and killed in this conflict is they are all Americans. And Lincoln had to think. He had to explain to himself, why is this happening? This was a problem, an intellectual problem for him, <clears throat> because Lincoln was a determinist. Uh, his parents, the, the Baptist church that they belonged in, believed in predestination. And Lincoln uh, gave up uh, their faith, but he retained a belief in predestination. He thought everything we do is caused. Uh, those actions also have causes, and they go back and back. Uh, he had a little phrase which his law partner, William Herndon, heard him use over and over again. The motive was born before the man. So before you are even born, actions have been taken which will determine every action that you take. And if you follow these actions back, they have to go back to the first cause, which is God. Paine, I said, was never an atheist. Uh, Lincoln was not an atheist. So, but he's a reasoning man. And if the Civil War 
is causing so much death and bloodshed, this has to mean that God wants it to. And why would God want it to go on in such a fashion? The answer Lincoln comes up with, he shares with the country in 1865. This is his second inaugural address. It's almost the shortest inaugural address that's ever been given. George Washington's second was, was shorter, but this one is only four paragraphs long. And he addresses this question in the third paragraph, uh, which is the longest of them. And he says, fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war might speedily pass away. Yet if God wills that it continue, and all the wealth piled by the bondman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, this is Psalm 19, verse 9, as was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So here we come to the last father, which is God the Father. Uh, when I came to read that speech, the, the two things that, that struck me are there are no founding fathers in it. They have disappeared. This is the only major speech that Lincoln gives uh, apart from the House Divided speech in which the founding fathers are not mentioned. They've been replaced by God the Father. The other thing that's striking about it is the math. The math of the Gettysburg Address, four score and seven from 1863, goes back to 1776. But 250 years of unrequited toil from 1865 is 1615. That is Jamestown, the first American colony, the first colony to import and use slaves. So Lincoln is saying this is the original sin of this country. We must all pay for it. 19-year-old kids from Vermont who've never seen a slave, much less own one, but if they have a cotton shirt or if they ever had sugar with their coffee, they are involved in this sin. They have to pay for it. 19-year-olds from Tennessee who've been as poor as Thomas Lincoln and never had a slave, they too must pay. This is a terrifying, unforgiving picture of God the Father. But there is a last paragraph. There is a fourth paragraph. It's one sentence long. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and a lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. And when I read that, I was struck by how many of those verbs are two-syllable verbs. Verbs are verb phrases. Strive on. Finish. Bind up, care for, do all, achieve, cherish. It's like walking. It's as simple as walking. It's as hard as walking when you've walked so long and you still have longer to go. Thanks very much. Are there microphones somewhere? Oh, here we go. Uh, so if you uh, would comply with a couple of basic rules about a brief question, um, 
I can hear you. I can, I can repeat. I'll, I'll speak loudly. Oh, there it goes. There you go. So I was wondering, from your perspective, when the, what triggers Lincoln's sort of change of thinking from when he first commenced his first term, where he sort of accepted this sort of compromise, like the Kansas-Missouri compromise and sort of the status quo, to where he ultimately comes out uh, formally with the, you know, push for emancipation? Was it, was it the war itself, or was there other triggering event that changes right. Lincoln's thinking? Well, um, the important thing to understand about the status quo is that Lincoln wanted to maintain that against Southern pressure to change it. I mean, there was a possibility there was a compromise proposal being discussed in Congress uh, as he's about to be inaugurated that would have extended the so-called Missouri line across the continent and said all to the north would be free, all to the south would be slave, but it le left open the possibility that we would take Cuba, Mexico, Central America. And Lincoln was, was very aware of that, very aware that, that Southerners had, had mounted uh, expeditions uh, to try and invade Cuba and Central America, and they were hoping to expand to the south. And that was their only hope of uh, maintaining parity uh, in the Senate. And so he, he rejected that compromise because that would not be the status quo. It would open the door to further expansion of slavery. Um, his position was we have to stop it where it is, and if it is contained, it was containment, you know, as, as our policy towards the Soviet Union was. If we contain it, it will, it will wither away and, and fall apart. Uh, obviously, uh, the stress of war uh, changes a lot of calculations. Um, one calculation is uh, black soldiers become necessary. And, uh, you know, how do you motivate them? Uh, is beating the South, beating disunion enough? Uh, emancipation is, is an even, obviously, an even greater incentive. Um, he also sees that his efforts to get the slave states who remained in the Union, because four slave states did, uh, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware, and he, you know, he made appeals to them, you know, look, uh, I'll offer so much money if you promise to end slavery by a certain time. He, he gave Delaware a very specific uh, a figure in a long, a long time. It was like the 1890s by which they would have to give it up. And Delaware was the smallest slave state, and there were no takers. I mean, not, not even Delaware would do it. So he's, he's, um, he's being boxed in as options are being closed off. And um, then the final uh, thing he tells his cabinet, and we have this from, from one of his cabinet members who kept a diary, is that when he tells them that he's, he's going to announce the Emancipation Proclamation. He said that he made a promise to himself, uh, this is if we get a, another victory, I, I will do this, because I don't want it to look like a desperation measure. We have to do this after a victory, not after a defeat. And Antietam was enough of a victory that he felt he could go ahead. He said, I made a promise to myself. And then this, this uh, man said, he paused and said, and to my maker, that I would, that I would issue this proclamation. So that's the final um, reason in his mind. So I think that's the evolution of his thought. Um, over the past few weeks, uh, in many of my classes, we've all had conversations about um, the current state of America and how we believe it could be declining and what do we want to do about that. And we always come to the conclusion that perhaps education is the answer. And we always wonder, well, what should we teach? Who should teach? How should it be taught? And I wonder if you would suggest um, Lincoln as somebody for us to look to um, as an educational leader, despite the fact he may not have received what we would think of as a traditional education. <laughs> well, he, cer he certainly <laughs> didn't. Um, well, look, we have to look at Lincoln, uh, I would say, for one reason, which is that uh, we may not be interested in history, but history is interested in us. I mean, it, it just is. It, you know, you, you can try to ignore it, but it's not going to go away, and its effects are not going to go away. 
So for that reason alone, uh, Lincoln and the Civil War have to be studied. Uh, as, as an example to us, I think Lincoln uh, is a good example of someone who uh, had a, a very principled mind, in some ways a razor trap mind, steel trap mind, um, you know, very clear about what he believed and not wanting to budge off it, combined with a very pragmatic politician. I mean, someone who's been in the game for most of his adult life, who really knows how it's played, um, who's, you know, willing to work with some rather dodgy characters who were in the Republican Party, uh, who was willing to bide his time, who was willing to sidle into advances rather than leap into them. Uh, one example of that is uh, before the Emancipation Proclamation is issued, uh, the great Republican editor Horace Greeley of the uh, New York Tribune, which was the largest newspaper in the country and a Republican paper and a very uh, liberal anti-slavery Republican paper, he published an editorial called The Prayer of Twenty Millions which was the population of the Union of all the free states uh, in the Union. And it was an appeal to Lincoln uh, not just to keep fighting this war for the sake of the Union, but to, uh, to make it openly a struggle against slavery. And then Lincoln's reply to Greeley uh, was, um, you know, it, it's kind of hedged. He says, if I could save uh, the Union without freeing any slave, I'd do that. If I could slave the Union while freeing some slaves and not freeing others, I would do that. If I could slave, uh, free, save the Union by freeing all the slaves, I would do that too. And this looks like a hedge, but of course what he's saying in his list of options is one thing he's intending to do, which is the Emancipation Proclamation, which is freeing some slaves and not freeing others because the Emancipation Proclamation was only the slaves of rebels. You know, he felt as commander-in-chief in a time of rebellion, he had the constitutional power to free the slaves of rebels simply by his proclamation, by his edict. He knew that he did not have the constitutional power on his own say-so to free the slaves in pro-Union states. That would have to be done by the states themselves or the way it was eventually done, which was the 13th Amendment. Actually, two, two, of, the, two of the states did in 1865. Missouri and Maryland did end slavery on their own. But then in, in Kentucky and Delaware and, of course, the whole rest of the country, it, 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 took, uh, it took the uh, 13th Amendment to guarantee that the war measure of the Emancipation Proclamation, you know, that some post-war Supreme Court would, wouldn't say, well, okay, the war's all over, now, now let's, let's bring slavery back in the South. So he's, he's an example of someone who is both principled and cunning. Uh, thank you. Elon Werman with the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. Thank you very much for your talk, Mr. Brookheiser. I was struck with something that you said in the beginning that Lincoln had to say, let us put slavery on the same footing that our forefathers put it on, this path to extinction. And I'm reminded by a vice presidential candidate about a decade ago who got excoriated for saying you know, that the framers did establish the conditions by which slavery would eventually be eliminated, but something intervened. And I think it's important to explore what is it that the framers couldn't anticipate that led to this great original sin extending much longer than it was supposed to and was anticipated? Was it just the cotton gin or what other conditions contributed to the perpetuation of slavery that the founders really did think uh, would end pretty quickly after the Constitution was adopted? Well, or you can challenge you the know, premises. I've, I've, I've talked with some cotton determinists and, uh, you know, so, certainly that's a huge thing. I mean, it's just a huge source of money. And Lincoln himself said, it's hard to see truth through an eagle, you know, $10 gold coin. Hard to see that through a $10 gold coin. But, uh, you know, I think the main attraction of slavery is that it's cool to own people. You know, we just have to face this. If you get over the initial repugnance, because I think there is just you know, kind of an initial repugnance 
that's kind of cool. You know, you can tell them what to do, and they just have to do it. And, and there were people, you know, there were people who moved from the north to the south. Uh, there was a governor of uh, Mississippi, Benjamin Quitman. He was from Rhinebeck, New York. And he moved down to Mississippi, and he thought this was just great. He became a big slave owner, and he, he supported a filibustering expedition to Cuba, um, led by a man named Narciso Lopez, who was captured and executed. And the only result of this is that Lopez's flag is the Cuban flag now. So the flag that the Castro brothers were uh, waving was the flag of this, um, this pro-slave uh, filibuster who was being paid by American Southerners to you know, take Cuba away from Spain, and then maybe we, we pick it up. So I, I, I'm afraid it's uh, the human heart is the problem. It's not just the cotton crop. They would have found other things to do. You know, because people say to me, oh, Egyptian cotton was coming out, and that was cheaper, and that would have ended the whole thing. I think you could find other, other ways to do it. Could I, I want to um, take uh, department head's privilege and ask a question. Uh, but I think we have time for, for uh, one or two more. Um, this makes me think your, your answer about a kind of ambition, ambition to rule over other people. Uh, there's a motif in your book, a phrase that Lincoln uses in his first great public speech, 1838, um, uh, which is often called the, per the perpetuation of our institution's address, or the Lyceum address, about the towering genius, the towering genius who might have the ambition to overturn a set of mm -hmm. decent laws, like the, the Constitution and laws of the United States. A towering genius, um, he cites the, a Caesar or a Napoleon. Okay. And throughout the book, you, you seem to play with these kinds of figures who, are t who, who Lincoln might have thought of as the towering geniuses who are trying to destroy the Constitution um, and the laws. And it seems like one of them at the end is Alexander Stevens, who you mm -hmm. have a portrait of earlier, the Vice President of the Confederacy, who, who, when he becomes Vice President of the Confederacy, makes this forthright statement about the superiority of slavery. Right, that right. Je Jefferson's just wrong. Or the Declaration is just wrong, <coughs> superior to slavery. So, could could you just t talk for a moment about who some of these f figures are who might have had the ambition to overturn what Lincoln thought was the most just statement about power and government, which was the Declaration, and then the the frame of laws uh, sure. around it. Sure. Well, I think when when he gives that speech in 1838, um, the person he's he's most immediately thinking of is Napoleon. I mean, Napoleon had died in 1820, so that's not so long ago. Um, Lincoln, one of Lincoln's favorite poets was Byron, and Byron wrote a poem, Ode to Napoleon Bonaparte, which re is a scathing, scathing poem, and really expressed the uh, kind of liberal disappointment with Napoleon. I mean, here's a man who takes a revolution in the name of liberty and, and makes himself emperor. And, and he cheapened himself and he lowered himself by doing this, is what Byron says. And I can't imagine uh, that Lincoln hadn't read that poem because he, you know, if when he was riding the circuit, if someone had Byron in their house, he was staying with them, he, you know, he'd ask to borrow it and read it. Uh, in his own life, uh, I thought some people who, who might fit this bill, uh, John Brown, um, you know, his solution to the slavery problem is, well, we got to go to Kansas and kill some slave owners. I mean, that's, that's really the only way. Uh, or, or let's um, foment. Um, uh, he didn't want, he didn't seem to have wanted a full-scale slave uprising throughout the South a la Haiti. He thought there would be like maroon communities. This is a name from the Caribbean of freed slaves who ran into the wilderness and formed their own self-governing communities, and they were called Maroons. And uh, I mean, they're still descendants of, of one such community in Jamaica to this day. Uh, so that seems to be what, what Brown had in mind. Uh, Alexander Stevens was um, the only reason I mentioned him out of all the Confederate leaders. He was a friend of Lincoln's. Uh, they served in Congress together. They were in the same party, the Whig Party. Lincoln was very impressed with Stevens' abilities. Uh, he said, he wrote home once, I, I've just heard the best speech of an hour I've ever heard by this consumptive little man, Alexander Stevens. Stevens never weighed more than 100 pounds. He was, he was just a 
feeble and ill all his life, but he was a, a considerable speaker. And um, Lincoln actually reached out to him, asked him to be in his cabinet, maybe Secretary of the Navy. He was looking for a Southerner. And Stevens said, well, you know, we need you to condemn John Brown. You know, and Lincoln is thinking, I've condemned John Brown dozens of times, over and over. You know, nobody, if I say it again, are they going to listen to that? No, they won't. And he wrote back to Stevens and said, you know, we think slavery is wrong and ought to be restricted. You think it's right not to be expanded. That's the difference. Uh, and there, so the correspondence petered out. And then um, Stevens, who's a unionist up to the very last minute, then Georgia secedes, and he becomes vice president of the Confederacy. And then he gives a very powerful speech several times. The, the text we have is from a performance he gave in Savannah, uh, which is called the Cornerstone Speech. It's the name given to it. And he says that one great thing about the Confederate Constitution is it has settled finally and forever the position of the Negro in our society. And that the proper position for him is slavery. You know, Mr. Jefferson and the men of his day, they thought slavery was a social, political, moral wrong. They didn't know how to end it, but they hoped in time that it would end. But now we understand they were wrong. They were mistaken. And, and he goes on to say there was slavery in the ancient world, but that was white people owning white people. That's wrong. We have it right. White people owning black people, this is the right thing. Isn't this great? And he uses a Bible verse that the, build, the, the stone that the builders have rejected has become the head of the corner. It appears several times in both Testaments. So uh, this is a very powerful speech. So I thought, you know, that's, that's, that's pretty out there. That's more than just uh, rebelling. You're, you're really saying why. Then, of course, the last one is John Wilkes Booth. Right? I mean, we, we, we console ourselves by thinking that presidential assassins are lunatics. You know, some of them have been, but a lot of them were principled. I mean, the, the man who shot McKinley was an <coughs> anarchist, and he thought he was doing this for the working man. And uh, Oswald was a Marxist, you know, who lived in the Soviet Union for a few years. And Booth was a Confederate. I mean, he was just a Confederate sympathizer. Uh, he was in touch with the Confederate Secret Service. He had a plan to kidnap Lincoln, which was kind of crackpot. And then he heard, he was actually in the audience for the last speech Lincoln gives, um, where uh, Lincoln, it's a speech he's giving from the White House to a, a crowd cheering the news of Appomattox. And in it, he says in public for the first time, uh, that he hopes uh, freed slaves in, he's talking about Louisiana, uh, will have the vote, that veterans and the very intelligent might have the vote. And Booth was in the crowd, and he said to one of his pals, he said, that means nigger citizenship. It's the last speech he'll ever give. And he turned the kidnap plot to a assassination plot at that point, and then he uh, murdered Lincoln. Um, so, and that was worth more than Chancellorsville. Man, that was worth more than, than all, those, all those great Southern victories. He, he did more than Lee and, and um, Stonewall Jackson. He struck the blow. He screwed us up good for 90 years. That was, that was a day's work. So, unfortunately. How do, oh, sorry. How do you think, think things might have uh, played out differently if Lincoln had been able to have a second term in the... Well, you know, there's a book, I, I saw a book just came out arguing, I think it was called The Impeachment of Abraham Lincoln. And it said, that, you know, that even as Andrew Johnson was impeached, he would have fallen afoul of Congress and, you know, that would have happened to him. I mean, certainly it was maybe the second hardest task a president has ever had. I guess winning the Civil War would be the hardest, but, you know, the, the handling the peace is, you know, just, just a, a monumental job. But, uh, and, and certainly also Lincoln was worn out. He was just physically, you can see the changes in him in the photograph. 
But Lincoln was a good politician. You know, he was a good politician. Uh, he was very good at keeping the Republican Party together, and that was really hurting cats a lot of the time. Uh, he would have come off the Civil War as the victor. Uh, certainly the freed slaves would have um, thought well of him. I mean, obviously, many many of the uh, rebel Southerners hated him, but, but others realized he's the best chance we have. Uh, he had a meeting with Confederate peace commissioners at the end of the war. It looked like there was a chance to maybe end it, you know, early, and it did, didn't work. But but one of them said to him, "Do you uh, do you consider us traitors?" And and Lincoln, you know, sort of made a joke of it. Said, "Well, that's about the size of it." And then this guy said, "Well." As long as you're president, we, we expect we won't be hanged. So he, you know, he recognized who Lincoln was and the magnanimity he had. And I think there were, there were other Southerners who, white Southerners who recognized that. So, um, you know, Eric Foner talks about this, I think, very intelligently at the end of his Lincoln book, The Fiery Trial. And he says, you know, you compare him to Andrew Johnson, who has no magnanimity, no generosity. Um, is a unionist, but is a dyed-in-the-wool racist. I mean, you know, you just make a list of qualities, and John, Andrew Johnson is just so much worse. And, uh, and we saw what ensued. And then Grant becomes president, and Grant really, really tries his best. But uh, by then, it's, uh, it's already very badly um, uh, begun. And you have to say that the resistance won. You know, the, the South lost the war, but the resistance won the peace, at least in the South, and, and had consequences nationally because people, you know, forgot. They, they papered over why the Civil War had been fought and bought the lost cause mythology that was kind of nationally accepted, and it was uh, serious. That's a sober note on which to end, um, but I, I recur, Let's all have dinner. Recur, yeah, recur to something uh, I mentioned in my introduction. The, the, the first part of Richard's book says that one reason to write this book is to really offer a civic education about, about America, that Lincoln living long after the founding could be a great student of it, and we can still be a great student of these ideas and these uh, debates today. So I have just a few closing um, Thanks to give. Uh, please do uh, stay for a reception that we have. Um, the, the civic education classics are still um, downstairs to look at them. The original edition of the Federals from 1788. Um, uh, Washington, Lincoln uh, are, are also there in the display case. Um, I do want to say thanks to uh, Dr. Carol McNamara, who is our Associate Director for Public Programs, and her team, um, Ty and uh, Taylor and uh, Gala and, and I'm forgetting people and our, our student workers for, for putting together this event. Please do get some of our literature about other speaker events we have in our series this year on polarization and um, civil disagreement. And with that, uh, again, the reception, but please join me in one more round of applause and thanks for Richard. <laughs>